um, remember when we did rheumatology board review? Mm -hmm. Have a patient, a patient with uh, um, really bad scleroderma, and uh, she also has mixed mixed connective tissue disease. She has both, and um, the poor lady developed renal failure, and we biopsy her because we didn't know we didn't know what what it was. I mean, I thought it was just going to be ATN or. And she also has superimposed lupus, so it, I really needed to do a biopsy because I didn't know, you know, what I was treating. And it turned out that she has um, um, thrombotic microangiopathy. Um, I don't know if you guys remember. So TMA can be seen in different settings. You can see that um, uh, in the setting of uh, hemolytic anemia, but you can also see renal TMA associated with scleroderma. And unfortunately, the lady didn't turn around, you know, and I. I, I even thought about doing plasma exchange, but what what really changed the prognosis for me or what really changed the management for me, and this is one of the utilities of doing a renal biopsy. When we're confronted with a renal, renal case, complex renal case, the biopsy not only establishes the diagnosis, but it also gives you prognosis. And um, at that point, we realized that the, the kidney was 40% replaced by, um, by scar tissue, but what we call in nephrology interstitial fibrosis in tubular atrophy. So I just started her on dialysis today, and I feel sorry for the lady because she's only 52, but pretty severe scleroderma, all the features and, and, and all the markers that we were reviewing the other day when we did the, the board review. Okay, so today we're going to talk about like, ID. Uh, ID is pretty dense, so we're going to try to keep it as friendly and as straightforward as possible. Um, but it's definitely, uh, I would say, 10% of your boards. Uh, what do I do here? If you go, we're using a different program, so oh, we yeah. present over to the right. Layout, layout, share, present, perfect. Yeah. Okay. There we go. You record, right? Say it again? You record. Yeah. You're recording, okay. All right, very good. So it's about 10% of your boards, I would say, you know, Big, big things, and we're gonna concentrate. I know you guys wanted me to talk about um, some derm stuff. I couldn't finish; it's too much. But I'm gonna see if I can come back. Um, uh, what, what's your last? When is your last day? Um, Thursday. Thursday. Thursday is your last day. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll ask Dr. Benzer if he wants me to present on Thursday, but um, but um, um, they do ask you a lot of questions, especially about uh, management of hospital-acquired infections. So we're gonna spend some time um, doing that. And you guys are probably going to end up rounding in hospitals. You need to know about these organisms that are getting more, increasing and increasing more and more attention. Um, but um, we're going to start with the, the respiratory system. Um, acute bacterial sinusitis is usually um, it's usually preceded by by a viral upper respiratory tract infection, um, and you, you start suspecting that you're dealing with a bacterial superimposed infection when the symptoms are not going away after 10 days. Um, when the patients are having acute symptoms, they can either have purulent nasal drainage. And um, the, the key point for the boards is that you don't necessarily have to give antibiotics on everyone with an acute bacterial sinusitis. And the other key point for the boards is that you don't do imaging because if you're gonna treat with antibiotics, you don't base that decision on on imaging. Imaging is usually pretty useless. Um, uh, plain, plain film is not, is not useful. I don't know if that's the case for pediatrics. I'm, I'm speaking about like internal medicine. Uh, but in, in adults, we don't do x-rays. And the CT is an overkill um, to expose someone to that kind of radiation just to diagnose uh, uh, acute sinusitis. Um, I personally try to stay away from antibiotics because of most of these infections, they, they self, they're self-limited and they resolve. But uh, uh, when they do microbiology analysis, aspirates, yeah, usually we have a strep pneumonia, H flu, you know, Haemophilus influenza, and more axilla catarralis. Um, and again, if the key, the high yield points, it's give antibiotics, don't do imaging if you're gonna decide to treat. I, tr I try not to treat with antibiotics and things that criteria that you look into making decisions is like if you have allergy symptoms, you have some viral um, component, and if the patient is stable and not toxic appearing, you, you're perfectly fine if you let them go with, with um, conventional treatment. So how, how would you treat sinusitis? Or what do you tell a patient? Depends. Uh, if I'm thinking viral, then nothing uh, supportive. 
Right. But if you were if you were to prescribe something, what what can you prescribe to the patient? Well, if you're gonna give antibiotics, you give augmenting. Um, but if you're gonna just do conservative measures, you can just tell them to, if they don't have a history of hypertension or other comorbidities, you can just tell them to take Sudafed. You can do, you can tell them to do saline, um, you know, ocean spray, mm -hmm. and you can prescribe a topical corticosteroid like Flonase or Flo or Nasonex. Um, now those are all over the counter, even the Nasonex. You can even buy without without a prescription. So. In reality, you don't need to give anything that's prescription, but sometimes the patients, they, they, have, they feel better when you give them a prescription. So you can give, um, um, you can give, you can prescribe because, um, again, you, if you have an insurance plan, if you give a prescription, you're gonna get covered. If you tell them just go buy, it's probably gonna be more expensive for the patients to do that. All right, um, so the other spectrum that, uh, of disease is chronic sinusitis. Typically, um, they're changing the, the, the criteria, the diagnostic criteria. In my organization, we don't treat unless the patient's heavy. We call it chronic after three weeks. Um, and um, for these patients, you can make an argument that you're gonna be, you're gonna be treating with antibiotics. Uh, you, do, you do imaging uh, in these patients when you're considering like either referring the patients for, for surgery when they have recurrent episodes, or when you're looking for some structural abnormalities precipitating um, the chronic uh, flares of the sinusitis. And I usually refer the patients to ENT when, when they have a lot of the, the symptoms. Okay, otitis media um, is uncommon in adults. If you, see, if you see otitis in adults, you have to wonder if the patient is a smoker, if the patient is a secondhand smoker, or if the patient has some sort of a structural abnormalities or some small vessel vasculitis. Uh, on your boards, they may give you a patient with recurrent sinusitis and recurrent otitis. And which small vessel vasculitis do you think when you hear that? Recurrent otitis and recurrent uh, sinusitis? Yes, but um, we don't call it Wegener's, but yeah. So um, for those patients, the diagnosis you establish it by sending an ANCA titer and you actually do a biopsy of the, of the sinus mucosa. Um, but every time you have an adult with recurrent otitis media, you think about what else could be going on. Um, bacteria, it's usually strep pneumonia and H flu. Um, again, you, you treat these patients either with, you should treat them with plain amoxicillin or you can give them augmenting. Um, complications, rare complications can include like mastoiditis, osteo, <coughs> Excuse me, and um, and meningitis, but I've never seen like uh, an adult getting complicated with meningitis, but it's been described. Okay, pharyngitis. So this is bread and butter. If you guys do urgent care work, um, you're gonna be dealing with this every single day of your of your shifts. Um, most patients are gonna go there for an antibiotic. Your job is to, and for the boards, it's important that you you know that we don't treat pharyngitis with antibiotics unless you have evidence of um, 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 uh, strep infection, like a group A um, beta hemolytic strep. Um, we have a couple of testing that we do in the urgent care. Uh, one is the rapid test, uh, rapid strep throat is pretty, it's pretty sensitive. And if, you're, if the rapid strep test is negative, you don't send the culture. I know that you know, most, most doctors, they end up sending a culture, but it's completely unnecessary because it's very, it's, very, it's very unlikely you're gonna have a false negative uh, rapid strep test. Um, another teaching point is that this type of um, infection is always susceptible to penicillin. It's a group B strep. I'm sorry, group A strep, I'm sorry. And it's 100% sensitive to penicillin. So that's the treatment of choice. I personally do the uh, benzatenic, like uh, either 1.2 million uh, IM times one. Some patients, they don't want needles or they're afraid of needles and uh, you can prescribe uh, uh, oral potassium penicillin. Uh, the problem is that most patients are not gonna complete the course that's pre prescribed and the way you sell it to the patient is like, it's one shot, you're gonna get over with it. And these patients with strep, they look very sick. They actually have high temperature, they have myalgias, sometimes they can even have abdominal pain. And uh, there, there, there are like diagnostic criteria. I forget what it, what it's called. The four diagnostic criteria. So for strep, you 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 ask about a runny nose, a cough, presence of lymph nodes, 
and um, fever. fever and the plaques. I think those are the five things. So if, if you have like all of them, the, your pretest probability that you're dealing with strep is pretty high. It's like in the 90s. If you don't have any of them, you're probably dealing with, with a viral pharyngitis, which is, like I said, most of the times, like more than 80% of the times is a virus. So again, strep patients don't have a runny nose, don't have a cough, and they typically have um, like these plaques and the enlarged lymph nodes. Okay, so uh, acute rheumatic fever um, is usually, um, we don't see it as often in the US, but they, they do ask questions on the boards. Uh, I saw a ton of this when I was in training. I, I went to medical school in Colombia, and um, it was pretty common to see patients with acute uh, rheumatic fevers. It's a clinical diagnosis. And over there, we used to send the ASO anti-streptolysin anti anti O titer, uh, which is one of the antigens in the, in the strep capsule. Um, uh, the treatment is basically you, you eradicate the group A strep with penicillin, and you deal with the complications. Now, unfortunately, that's one of the reasons why we treat strep, because a lot of the times you don't treat them and the, the symptoms go away, but if the patients keep having a recurrent strep infection, they end up, this is one of the complications of a uh, recurrent. Um, so, this is actually the major and the uh, minor criteria. Uh, this, these are, this is important that you memorize this for your boards, the Jones criteria. So you actually, you diagnose if you have two major, um, if you have group A strep and two major criteria, or group A strep, one major and two minor. So the major, we know the migratory arthritis, particularly from the large joints. These patients have car carditis or myocarditis. Um, they have subcutaneous nodules. The erythema, we call it marginatum. It's actually, you know, it, it sometimes it comes and goes, but you can see like at the, um, the um, um, in different places and uh, it's very, it's, it's, a, it's usually like a, it's a macular rash, it's not palpable. And, um, and the patients can rarely, no, no, we say 20%, I, I only saw one patient presenting with chorea symptoms. And the minor criteria are the fever, arthralgias, uh, usain inflammatory markers, CRP, ESR, and um, 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 uh, you, you typically, these patients, you have to treat them aggressively with penicillins. They can become very, very sick if you don't, if you don't treat them. Um, this is gonna be on your board guarantee. This is the rash that people believe is an allergy, but it's not. It's actually when you expose a patient with infectious mononucleosis with, uh, to amoxicillin. Again, all of the patients are gonna go asking for an antibiotic. Your job is gonna be, is gonna educate them and tell them, you know, your strep test is negative. We're just gonna treat you with supportive measures. I recently had a patient that she was so insisting that she wanted to get tested and she tested positive for mono. That's, that's basically the, the, the test. It takes, about four, it takes about two to three days. It doesn't come back right away. So there's really no utility of doing that in the urgent care unless the patient feels very strong like this lady. She wasn't happy with my explanation. I told her like, listen, I did a culture is negative. I did a, I did a rapid strep is negative. And she still wasn't satisfied and she wanted to get, a, she wanted to get a, a, an answer to her concerns. And on the boards, key points is like, when the patients have uh, suspected mono, you need to do a physical exam. If they have a splenomegaly, you need to advise them against any contact sports. And if you give them moxicillin, they're gonna come to you like this. And your answer is, you need to stop the antibiotic immediately. That's basically the correct next step in the management. Okay, so bronchitis, I think I told you guys a few weeks ago that this is a change in practice. We don't treat bronchitis with antibiotics. Um, the way you treat patients is by educating them, by explaining to them that um, this is probably related to a virus that is self-limited. The reason why we don't do antibiotics in, in, in bronchitis is because they haven't been proven to be beneficial in randomized trials. And, um, and you need to tell them that to expect to cough for at least two to three weeks, and sometimes even longer than that. One of the important things for your, for your clinical practice, if a patient already, already passed three weeks and the cough is not getting better and, and probably getting worse, you think about what condition? If the cough is worsening, do you guys remember what do you think about? We have, a, we have an outbreak here in California we think about whooping cough, uh, pertussis.
So there is a test, it's very easy to do, you do it in the office, it's a uh, pertussis PS PCR, you just need to advance uh, the nasal swab all the way down to the posterior pharynx, it's a very uncomfortable test because you need to do it through the nostril. So you advance the swab all the way there and then you rotate it, then you send the sample, it doesn't come right away, it takes about a day or two. And do you guys know how we treat pertussis? I remember, which is the antibiotic of choice? Doxy or acethro. Mm -hmm. the, the problem is that typically we give CPAC for most patients with upper respiratory problems, but CPAC is insufficient because CPAC is only five days, and um, typically we treat pertussis for, for, from seven to ten days. So uh, what I do is usually I, I give them CPAC if they're not getting better, I test, and if they come back positive by that time, I already know that the patient is getting treated, I just need to prescribe another course. So they, they get covered. It is a reportable, mandatory reportable disease. So every time I get, I get a positive test for pertussis, I need to report it to public health. Um, but again, if the patient is healthy, you just tell them we're going to give you cough suppressant. Which cough suppressants do you guys know from the urgent care? If you guys have ever worked in the urgent care. Which cough suppressants do you guys remember? Prescription cough suppressant because of the, all the other ones are over the counter. Dexamethorphan is uh, Delsim, I think. I think that's, that's over the counter. Uh, Robitussin with codeine uh, is very effective. Um, you know, obviously don't, don't give it to somebody with multiple psychotropic medications, but it's very effective. Uh, there is another um, uh, Tesselon, benzo, benzonatate pearls. That's actually a centrally acting, uh, it, it, it binds to the, cent to the cough center and it, it, it uh, suppresses cough. Another thing that you can do for those patients that they don't, want, they don't want any codeine cough syrup, you can prescribe Tylenol number three. And Tylenol number three is actually, I think it has like 10 milligrams of codeine. It's very effective uh, suppressing cough. So you're basically, if the patient is having like pain, not feeling well, that's actually a good way of uh, making them feel better because with, uh, you kill two birds with one stone. Um, but the bottom line for your boards is you do not give antibiotics, you give uh, supportive therapy. Sometimes you tell the patient, go ahead and buy a humidifier. Um, I can give you an inhaler if they're wheezing. You can give them some prednisone if they're having wheezing on exam. Um, and most patients, they just get better, okay? So COPD, um, if, you get, if you get an acute exacerbation, I'll tell you guys later that we don't, we don't really have very good data on whether or not antibiotics should be used, but it's very common practice that if you're dealing with a COPD exacerbation that you prescribe antibiotics. Do you guys remember which antibiotic is the antibiotic of choice for patients with COPD exacerbations, outpatient? Doxycycline, very safe. It's a very old fashioned antibiotic, very cheap, um, and it, it usually works pretty well for patients. All right, why don't you help me read this question, please? An 18 year old male presents to your office with mild fever and cough several days duration, negative PMH. Uh, no history of right. mm -hmm. No history of recent antibiotic use. Um, so good exam. Um, Oxygen saturation. Yeah. 99% capsules left in your lung. Um, chest x-ray shows infiltrate in the mid left lung. What is the most appropriate treatment? What do you guys think he has? Mm -hmm. Which one? Strep Any other takers? He's 18. He looks pretty good. Walking and walking pneumonia. Yeah. How do you treat walking pneumonia? Yeah, or like any macrolide. Yeah, so the walking pneumonia is actually interesting because the patient looks fine. You may hear some crackles, the chest x-ray looks terrible. And, but the patient looks fine and they're saturating fine. And usually they're young people. So, um, speaking about community acquired pneumonia, um, we know that the pneumococcal pneumonia is the most common. Um, and the test, the screening test is a urine antigen. I usually do it on everybody that I'm admitting with pneumonia. Um, unfortunately, we have a very aggressive pathogen called MRSA. These patients, they go down very quickly. If you miss MRSA pneumonia, your patient is probably not going to be alive in the next 48 hours unless you start treating it. And this is why you use your clinical judgment. If the patient is, is really sick, you need to cover for MRSA until you get the sputum, sputum back. Um, and um, these patients are usually septic. 
uh, or they have risk factors like history of IBU or um, they had recent like a soft skin and soft tissue infection or we talked about it last week the patient recently were, was exposed to influenza so after influenza you get pneumonias typically staph pneumonia and sometimes MRSA pneumonia okay Legionella um, it can come in epidemics I think it was first described in the 1970s I think uh, it was described by, by a, a physician that isolated the pathogen in the air ducts, in the air conditioning ducts from, like they were doing some sort of like meeting for the American Legion, and that's why they came up with this name, Legionella. Um, but when you hear about like air conditioner, hotel, cruise, summer, um, think about uh, Legionella. Uh, one of the things that is interesting is they can give you diarrhea. So if you have pneumonia and GI symptoms, think about Legionella and you can actually test for that also by doing a urine antigen so i usually send it like and when i have a patient i'm meeting a patient with pneumonia i usually send the urine antigen for both um, klebsiella on your boards typically they give you an alcoholics with some sort of aspiration um, h flu and morxella catarrhalis are more common in patients with um, um, chronic obstructive lung disease um, pseudomonas we know that usually in cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis, severe COPD, or if the patients have been exposed to some sort of like chronic steroids. Um, adolescents and outpatients who are not that ill, you consider mycoplasma. You can send uh, um, um, a serology or chlamydia pneumonia. Um, I usually send all the, the package again when I admit. And anaerobic bacteria for those at risk of having aspiration pneumonia. Okay, Q fever. On your boards, they give you like a, like either they have like a some sort of like farm animal or like, like a cat that just deliver in the placenta, um, and uh, these patients they can present very very sick. Viral pneumonia is less common in adults, but it's it's, it's seen by either adenovirus, parainfluenza, RSV, and um, and some some other like respiratory pathogens that we don't we don't necessarily test for. Uh, histoplasma, bat or bird droppings. I've never seen a histoplasma case here in, in California. Uh, Francisella, you think about rabbits. Hantavirus, we do have that here in California. Once in a while we get um, um, uh, severe pneumonia from uh, hantavirus. It can actually give you a white lung and uh, usually associated with rodent um, um, feces or urine. And um, uh, coxy. It's pretty prevalent in, in California. If you guys end up, I don't know if you have it in Oregon, but here, it's it's actually to the point that if you practice, if you end up practicing in, in Bakersfield, or in some mid mid um, some like Barstow on the way to Vegas, or Bakersfield or any any places around that area, the way they treat is they always treat the patients like community acquired pneumonia plus fluconazole, because the the incidence of uh, cox is so so high. Uh, and it's interesting because this disease doesn't affect everyone. For some reason, some some genetic genetic susceptibility, uh, Hispanics and Filipinos are more are more at risk of developing. I'm talking about immunocompetent hosts than the rest of the population. But uh, there is a famous prison in California that is in that area. I forget what it's called. But um, like the the prisoners there, it's almost guaranteed that you're going to end up developing coxy pneumonia, which is also known as you guys know how we call coxy pneumonia? What's the slang name for coxy pneumonia? If the patient tells you, oh, I got the Samokin Valley Fever, it's called Valley Fever. Yeah, Samokin Valley Fever. So I think that's where the prison is. And it's very common, actually, over there is like, like, coxy is a nasty disease. Coxy can, can be from like pneumonia to like sepsis or osteomyelitis. It's, it can be, can be pretty aggressive, especially with those, for those patients that are immunocompromised. Okay. So the guideline, again, they only recommend doing a screening like sputum and investigating further in, in high-risk patients. I'm going to like, put it there for your review. Um, but I generally, generally speaking, every time I admit someone with radiography evidence of pneumonia, I do send everything. I, I've, been, I've been burned in the past. Um, blood cultures, they're low yield, but when you have a positive blood culture, that's actually diagnostic. And, and patients are usually very sick when that happens. Um, and chest x-ray universally, so it's simple, non-invasive test. Okay, treatment, 
um, it's we don't really we don't fortunately we don't really have a lot of uh, drug resistant strep so we do we do treat the patients either with a macrolide or doxycycline I like doxycycline because it covers typicals and atypicals um, for the outpatient setting if you have somebody who is like 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 more sick you can actually give them Vaptin which is a fourth generation oral cephalosporin um, and you can treat them with uh, macrolide um, but in the in the ward typically we look at the clinical scenario if you know that the patient is like in the ICU severe um, like very septic you definitely you brought you know you do broad spectrum antibiotic um, including a beta lactam and and um, and acetromycin and if you suspect MRSA definitely you do uh, vancomycin if you are concerned for pseudomonas then you do um, out, an out anti-pseudomonal penicillin like I usually use sosin um, but you can use any of them on the, of the penems like imipenem or mirapenem Fluoroquinolones in the inpatient. Do you guys know why we don't we don't like fluoroquinolones a lot? Do you guys know why ID doctors are usually against uh, levaquin and, and Cipro? Because fluoroquinolones actually have activity against tuberculosis. So you may be masking a, a pulmonary tuberculosis by treating it with patients get better, but that's not the treatment. And so the patients actually can actually have like a delay in the diagnosis and they can end up passing it on to other people okay so for the elderly look at the respiratory rate they're usually tachypnea is, is usually the best marker in the elderly um, we don't necessarily need to do follow-up chest x-rays on everyone except you have a high risk patient like say a smoker uh, because once the infiltrate clears up then if you had a tumor or like post obstructive pneumonia you're going to be able to catch that but we don't necessarily need to do follow-up chest x-ray on everyone. Smoking cessation universally when, when present. And basically, um, it's important that you tell the patient that they're going to still have symptoms after completing the treatment. They're still going to have symptoms because that's one of the things. When you, when you have these patients with either acute bronchitis or pneumonia, they still have symptoms and they get very nervous and they start coming to you and people usually start prescribing more antibiotics. You don't need to do that. It's just expected that, you know, this post-inflammatory, you know, reactive airway is going to go away like after a couple of months of, of getting an infection. Okay, so you need to know this for the boards, uh, healthcare associated pneumonia. Uh, these are the risk factors. Um, these patients usually, they have like a, um, a lot of um, hospitalizations, like dialysis patients are at risk. Like every time I admit a patient, Dialysis patients that have been like in a healthcare facility, I have to suspect uh, um, hospital acquired pneumonia. And typically, we treat these patients when they have when they have no risk for multi-drug resistant drugs. We just give them ceftriaxone, and you can give them um, uh, unisin, which is the ampicillin sulbactam, or sosin. And again, levofloxacin. I usually don't do it for the reasons that I just explained. But if they have like risk factors for multi-drug resistant, so then you go like with more like heavy weapons like ceftacidine, and um, and and these patients usually they usually they usually they're sicker. You know they you use a lot of your clinical judgment because none of these tests are coming back in the first in the first 48 hours when you admit a patient. So or let's say that you're treating somebody with hospital acquired pneumonia, the oxygen are re the oxygen requirements are increasing, the patient is becoming septic. Do not hesitate to add vancomycin. Just step up the coverage on these patients. So I'm sure you heard about ventilator-associated pneumonia. It's uh, usually um, um, it's the number one risk factor to be on the ventilator. And these patients actually they have a high mortality. And this is the reason why we try we make every possible effort to get people off the vent. Like after five days five days of being on the vent, like all sorts of things just start happening. And uh, ventilator-acquired pneumonia is one of them. You need to treat these patients aggressively. They need like chest physical therapy. They need aspiration. And typically you treat them for about eight days, but the, the key thing is to get them off the vent if they're, if they're mechanically ventilated. Okay, so hospital acquired infections is also another big topic in the boards. So um, um, one of the things they're gonna pin you on is the catheter associated urinary tract infection. So before you prescribe a catheter, think about it. Do I really need it? 
and if you don't really need it please don't prescribe it because number one is it's in, inconvenient but for the patient it's painful and it can increase the risk of uh, having a catheter associated UTI um, so by the same token when you guys are doing lines when you're interns and residents you're gonna be doing lines and uh, um, either you do a dialysis catheter we call a quinton or you do a triple lumen for for a patient that went to the ICU and is septic so we have an entity called the central line associated blood, blood uh, uh, stream infection um, these patients they get very sick very quickly and they can either grow MSSA or MRSA or they can even grow um, um, quag negative strep I'm sorry quag negative stuff and the key point for the aborts is that you have to remove that line ASAP. Otherwise, because the line is seated, you treat them and the, once you're done with the antibiotics, the bacteria is going to start like, like shedding again and, and you're going to have recurrent infection. Um, and other things that are, are common in the hospital is the skin and soft tissue infections. Like uh, within 30 days of surgery or local manipulation or, or manipulation of the skin. Staph aureus is the most common. And then, again, the way we protect the patients is by doing sterile techniques. Every time you do a procedure, you do like all, you follow all the standard procedures. Um, K, um, hospital acquired infection. So I have MRSA, um, it's, it's huge. So that's the reason why we do contact isolation. If, you, if you're working in a hospital, make sure you wear the gown. If you don't wear the gown and one of the nurses catch you, you're gonna be in big trouble. Uh, you're gonna get a letter for sure. You, a, a patient one time asked me, like, did you wash your hands, doctor? And I said, like, oh, that's a good question. I didn't wash my hands before I, I, I entered the room. And the guy told me, like, you know who told me that? Like, who? The nurse told me to ask you. That's why I'm asking you. So they're training the patients to ask that question to the physician. So that's huge. The, the efforts to contain these infections, it all depends on us and, and the proper follow of the protocols and guidelines. Um, if you have pneumonia, you use either VANC or you can do um, linezolid. And some patients, some, some physicians are, are, more, are, are using daptomycin more and more frequently. It's expensive and I really see no difference between vancomycin and daptomycin um, when you treat these patients. VRE um, is also a, another infection, the vancomycin resistant enterococcus. You need to make sure that you, you follow contact precautions and uh, typically you, they respond to ampicillin. Um, so we don't treat asymptomatic patients unless they, like colonized patients, we, we don't treat them because we know we cannot eradicate it. And uh, ESBL, which is getting increasingly common, especially in those patients requiring antibiotics. My wife, my wife has, a, has kidney stones and the stones that she forms are related to uh, uh, Proteus. Um, so she's gotten multiple rounds of antibiotics and the last time that she got a UTI, she developed ESBL. So I had to give her home IV antibiotics for seven days. So just to tell you guys how crazy it is that when we prescribe antibiotics, make sure that you have a strong reason to prescribe it. If you don't have a strong reason, this is what could happen. Make it, uh, the, the extended spectrum beta-lactamase uh, E. coli is very difficult to eradicate and, and you really don't have any good options. You need to treat these patients with IV antibiotics. Okay, UTIs, bottom line is that um, you only screen and you treat pregnant women and those patients that are doing uh, urological procedures if they're not having any symptoms. If your patients are not having symptoms, don't screen and don't treat because we don't want that. That's, that's evidence-based. You only screen the pregnant ladies and the urological procedures because if you, if you have an infection and you do a urological procedure, the next thing you're going to know is that your patient is going to die from sepsis. Um, but um, that's, that's the bottom line. You don't necessarily have to do a culture if the patient has a classic UTI. So in the urgent care, we have protocols in place where the patient has classic symptoms, you, you prescribe an antibiotic. I personally always do an, a culture because I want to be able to compare. If a patient has recurring UTIs, I want to be able to, to know what I'm dealing with, what kind of organism I, I'm dealing with. But the teaching point is that they're going to try to trick you is that you start treating patients with asymptomatic uh, um, you don't do asymptomatic um, urinary tract infections. So you already know only pregnant and patients undergoing urological procedures. So endocarditis prophylaxis, um, this is a good thing that they decrease the indications. Before 2007, we would give, we would give antibiotics to everyone. So now we really, we really 
pin it, we really narrow it down to these categories. Either you have some prosthetic valve, so either you've had a previous episode of endocarditis, either you have congenital heart disease and not necessarily any congenital heart disease, but the one I mentioned here, or the patients that are, they actually have a cardiac transplant, they, are, they develop cardiac valvulopathy. So those are the patients that we treat. Before we used to treat everybody like literally like very low threshold to prescribe antibiotics. Nowadays, only those four categories. The way we treat it, preferably is amoxicillin, two grams one hour prior to the procedure. You just tell the patient to take four or 500 milligram capsules. Or if for those that are allergic to penicillins, you can always do clindamycin. Um, IV, IM, you do clindamycin as well if you, if you have to. So antibiotic prophylaxis is not recommended for bronchoscopy unless the patient is going to have an incision. And I'm talking about like those, those four categories of, of patients that I mentioned. Same regimens that I mentioned, usually amoxicillin. Patients do very well with amoxicillin. And um, for those patients that are having GI biliary and GU procedures, um, we only treat them if they meet the criteria that I mentioned and if they're having like, like high-risk cardiac conditions. The same antibiotic treatment. Okay, so I'm going to ask you questions to make sure that everybody's clear on this. If I have a patient uh, with a history of infective endocarditis and patient is getting a root canal, do you treat or you do not, do not treat with antibiotics? We treat. You treat because the patient had infective endocarditis in the past. And you treat with one antibiotic? Which antibiotic we give? Or amoxicillin. If, if, you're, if your patient is allergic to amoxicillin, you do Clinda. And the dose is 2 grams. Okay? So next, next question. Patient with a prosthetic aortic valve undergoing a screening colonoscopy with expected biopsy to the polyp. Do you treat? Yeah. Yes, you do. Uh, getting a transbronchial biopsy or, of a mediastinal lymph node. Do you treat? Yeah. Yes, because he's going to get a biopsy. Mm -hmm. if they're going to cut the mucosa. If it's just a diagnostic bronchoscopy, you don't have to. So, patient with mitral valve prolapse with regurgitation getting a cystoscopy? No. no. Before, we used to give it to everybody with mitral valve prolapse. Um, so, if you have to guess, like let's say you don't know, probably chances are that no prophylaxis is indicated. But remember the four categories. I'll, I'll, you guys are going to get a copy of this slide so when you're doing your, your board review. Okay, so endocarditis, um, you need to know about the, you know, the Janeway lesions, the, the other immunologic phenomenon, including the Osler nodes, and the, uh, they're very painful and raised. I've only seen that once. And the retina, you can get the rot spots. And these patients can actually develop hematuria, or they can even develop a post-infection glomerulonephritis. And this is a type of uh, immune complex mediated glomerulonephritis. Um, and when you have aneurysms related to um, fungal infections, you can actually develop mycotic aneurysms. So diagnostic tests, like almost always, the patients have a positive blood culture. There are a few subset of patients that they have a culture negative endocarditis. Do you guys remember what the name of those organisms are? HASIC. Haemophilus, Agregativacter, Actinobacillus, Cardiobacterium, Echinechia, and Kingella. I never memorized them, I just know the HASIC. So it's about 3% of them. So again, you diagnose these patients by, if you have a positive blood culture, you have a vegetation on the, on the transthoracic echo, you got the diagnosis. If you don't, if you have a negative transthoracic echo, that doesn't rule it out. The patients, they need to have a transesophageal echocardiogram. Do you know how that's done? Have you guys ever seen a transesophageal echo? It's like an upper endoscopy almost, and the patients, they get a little bit of conscious sedation. It's pretty labor intensive and it's very operator dependent. You know, usually the fellows in the teaching hospital are the one doing that and they spend a lot of time doing these things. Um, but, uh, but again, if you have a negative transthoracic, doesn't mean that you don't have it. You need to rule it out with uh, transesophageal. Um, you can see the specificity, the sensitivity goes up from 60 to 95 percent when they do the transesophageal echocardiogram. Okay, so these patients, um, 
um, with uh, culture negative infective endocarditis they can have everything else except the culture and it's the reason is that those organisms are very fastidious and they're very difficult to grow in the in the typical culture environment um, if you have strep viridens which is the typical like dental patient um, you treat them with uh, either ampicillin or ceftriaxin if you have enterococcus you treat them with ampicillin if you have MSSA, you treat them with uh, oxycillin for no less than six weeks. Some physicians, they add gentamicin. In my hospital, I've never seen that. They always treat with, uh, you know, uh, oxycillin. MRSA, vancomycin for six weeks. And if you have any of the culture negative, you treat with ceftriax or, or, or sometimes they do like the unison. Okay, these are the pearls. If you get, if you develop the streptococcal bovis and after a colonoscopy, you think about cancer. So don't get it wrong. I got that one on my boards. If you have a, a patient with Q fever and endocarditis, so you think about like um, these patients having like fibrosis, a lot of fibrosis and the esiopathology, and these patients are usually very sick. Um, if you have um, Really, really bad uh, quad negative staph is usually staph ludinensis. Um, I've never seen it, but in the boards, usually they ask that. Uh, for Bartonella, usually patients are homeless alcoholics, they have lice, they live with cats, and um, yeah, and the HASIC. So just, just try to memorize the HASIC before you, on the day before your test. So those, you're gonna forget those names. Okay. So indications for surgery, um, if the patient has an acute rupture, there's nothing you can do. They called me on a consult on Saturday, a patient with endocarditis, she ruptured one valve. She went from, from peeing to making no urine and she was so hypotensive, she was in cardiogenic shock from this, so we transferred her to Sunset. She was gonna get a valve repair and she probably needed dialysis because she was making not a single drop of urine. Um, if you have an abscess, you need to surgically resect it. If you have fungal endocarditis, always they need to go and, and clean. Um, if the patient has an AV block or recurring major embolic events like renal infarction, you look at the extremities, you look at the digits in the hands and the feet, and you, you actually see infarct. So that's, that's, that's basically, that tells you that there is a shower emboli phenomenon, and these patients, they need to have like, um, and uh, uh, surgery to be able to resect the uh, vegetations. Okay, so MSSA, typical IV drug user. Um, so you treat them with oxycillin. If you have a prosthetic valve, um, you treat them with uh, oxycillin and rifampin. And if you have MRSA, again, vancomycin, rifampin, and some doctors do gentamicin. Okay, so CNS infections, important things you need to know is if the patient has a focal deficit, you think about an abscess. If the patient has confusion, that's the, present, the, the predominantly presenting complaints, you think about encephalitis. And if the patient has neck stiffness and headaches, you think about meningitis, okay? So very different, very different um, physiopath in each of them. And it's important that you identify something like herpes encephalitis very quickly because the treatment really impacts mortality. Patients with untreated HSV encephalitis, they can actually go down very quickly. Um, a lot of the times you need to have a, a CT and an LP for diagnosis. Remember that you always do a CT before you do an LP. Um, um, it's malpractice if you, if you don't do a CT first. Um, if the patient has hydrocephalus or anything like that, you, you, you shouldn't be doing an LP. Um, so you think about, um, you look for the gram stain and have you ever guys, have you ever rotated through a hospital? Have you ever done an LP yourself? Yeah, so you do, you do a lot of, uh, you send a lot of the, uh, typical, typical stuff. So the typical stuff is the gram stain. You look for bacteria, um, but you also send the India ink. You look for cryptococcal. Uh, who gets cryptococcal? You guys remember? Cryptococcal meningitis? HIV. HIV. And who else? Transplant patients, yeah, immunocompromised. Yeah, so, but you also check for protein, for glucose, and for cell count, and either you have like some sort of bacterial antigen. I have a table that I wanna share with you. So, 
um, this is the opening pressure, the first column. The second column is the number of uh, leukocytes and bacterial. Usually you see predominantly neutrophils and you see a lot, like, like more than 5,000. Um, glucose is usually very low in bacterial infection as well as the cryptococcal infections. And the protein usually tends to be very elevated in the setting of a bacterial infection, but not so much in the others. Um, and one other thing that's important to know in, in bacterial infections is that you can see the gram-stained organisms in about 90, up to 90% of the cases. Um, for those patients with cryptococcus, you need to do an India ink. And for those patients that you suspect TB, you do um, an AFP. And in addition to all the other stuff that we normally send for everybody with uh, suspected uh, infectious CNS pathology. Okay, so meningitis. Um, typically, you, you always do cultures and then you start antibiotics. Sometimes you don't have time to wait for the lumbar puncture, but the, the important thing is that you do, send the, you do send the blood cultures because these patients, they, they can, um, it can really make a difference if you start identifying or isolating what you're treating. Um, meningitis is primarily pneumococcal. Um, it's mostly like 70%, like I was mentioning before. Is either a complication of an otitis, sinusitis, or pneumonia. Um, but you can also see um, the nasir nasir nasiria. Uh, typically, in your boards, they're gonna tell you like somebody like in the military, like crowding conditions, or in college, a young adult, and they describe like a particular rash. And these patients usually have a lot of neutrophils in the, in the CSF. Um, H flu, I used to see that, but now we everybody gets uh, H uh, Haemophilus influenza vaccine, so you rarely see this. Um, listeria, you see it in pregnancy and immunosupp immunosuppressed patients, and the Staph aureus. Um, typically, you see patients with a history of uh, um, neurosurgery, neurosurgery, or patients with uh, penetrating trauma of the skull. Okay, so. Like the associations, if you see the cranial nerve involvement, you think about like either a patient has sarcoidosis or TB or Lyme's disease. Um, you guys are all from the East Coast, right? You guys are all from the East Coast? No? Anybody from the, from the West, right? You guys are all from the West, right? Midwest? Do you have Lyme's disease in your town? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we rarely see this here in California. It's mostly in Northern California, but 